It seems that we are live once again. It's a second uh, edition of In The Metal. Uh, we got through our first edition and it looks like we're back again for more. So um, we haven't been thrown off the internet. So welcome to uh, In The Metal. I am Johnny McElhern of The Watch Press, uh, Irish watch guy. And In The Metal is all about the incredible world of independent watchmaking. Uh, we It's a show that we talk to the innovators, the creators of, you could say, modern uh, modern history in terms of mechanical art. These are the guys that are, uh, in hundreds of years' time, people will be looking back on the watches that these guys are making today and looking at them probably as museum pieces. And uh, so this is a, a very, very specialised uh, sector of uh, a, a much larger industry. These are the artisans. These are the guys who are making their watches by hand using old fashioned machinery, lathes and engine turning, engine roses, etc. And um, so uh, we're uh, looking to uh, talk to people from all genres and all walks of life within the independent watch sector. And we reckon we've probably got the longest couch in the world because tonight our show goes from Warren Point in Ireland to Zurich in Switzerland and across the pond to North Carolina in the United States of America where we have a guy who has already achieved notoriety, great fame and acclaim as one of hell, heavy metal's hell raisers who's now become, and I say become because you don't do that over the space of a few weeks on a whim, uh, 25 years of experience um, working as a master, uh, refining his art to become a master watchmaker. Uh, this guy is a former lead guitarist with Anthrax, and he is Mr. Dan Spitz. Are we connected, Mr. Spitz? I can't hear oh, you at all. Not again. <laughs> hey, everybody. Peace out to everybody. I hope you're all doing well today. I'm in my uh, my little studio here, or you can call it the atelier if uh, you're across the pond somewhere. And uh, I'm working hard on my movement. I'm glad to be here to share some knowledge uh, from some of my heroes uh, in watchmaking. Uh, and I like to pick, uh, there's a lot of heroes that are, you're, you're starting to see a theme to the beginning of our shows here that are the behind the scene heroes that sometimes you don't hear about, uh, or I didn't know about till years into my uh, in-depth uh, uh, training and time in Switzerland to find out, you know, who the ghost builders were, who the, the masters were behind the master, who was really creating you know, some of the hardest parts within a movement, and it wasn't those big name manufacturers. When they got stuck, who did they go to? And these are the guys who are my friends. Um, and we, you know, sometimes have to develop parts and they have to develop parts for people. And we have to sign agreements where we can't say the names of the companies, um, and, you know, NDAs they're called in the regular business. And, and uh, these are those people. So I'm, I'm trying to bring a little shining light to the geniuses, the masters that it, if you, Made an equivalent to this would be, uh, you know, the writers of hit songs behind pop stars. You know, it's not the pop star on the stage. It, these are the these are the writers. For sure, for sure. So, uh, hey, before we uh, get on to our first guest, uh, Dan, you're working very hard on your own project. You're uh, uh, you're you're nearing that uh, the completion where we hope to see the, the 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 final piece. Last week we were talking. You're working on your. Uh, the escape wheel, your escapement and titanium, the work that was going into that, the hours and hours and hours without end, just you know, on a little detail that some people will look at and go, oh, that's nice. But for you, that's been, you know, days, weeks of work. How are you getting on with your, your new watch? Years and years. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, um, the entire escapement is all the pieces are being made out of titanium. So that's been a little rough ride because there's no answers here where I am in, in the States, you know, of, or, or even to make some of these parts because they've never been done as far as I know out of titanium. So it's coming along wonderfully. The whole escapement is just, you know, it's badass, man. It's, it's, brilliant, brilliant. it's not a normal lever escapement. So there's, there's no rules to this road. 
Uh, the escapement is four years in development, completely separate from my watch. Just the escapement was four years of development through uh, with my friends at Arts Mechanics and Cyril Brevet uh, Nadal, who, who has his uh, timepiece out using this escapement. It's sure. it's mind blowing, well, yeah. and it's and it's part of that open source uh, watchmaking that I'm trying to infect the world with. This is one of the things about independent watchmaking that there's so much, you know, cross pollination. That there's uh, people help one another out, and whenever do you know, they work with each other to achieve a result. So it's uh, it, it, yes, you're you're all competitors in a sense, but you're all part of a family as well. And speaking of family, we have a great old friend who is sitting there in Zurich town and I would love to introduce him and uh, his name is uh, Mark Genny and Mark are we reaching perfectly fine perfectly hey fine there. how are you fine hey, fine yourself gentlemen great then to see you, Johnny some high uh, from Switzerland to the states and to Ireland see how well, I did that <laughs> it, it's almost like becoming like a song contest, right? International song contest. <laughs> and that's not true. We'll have the technology where we can watch maker jam. <laughs> exactly. This is this is actually something I proposed to Johnny like a couple of days ago. You know, we should all wear like our um, uh, camera on the top, and when you're working on the bench, right? You can uh, almost like live stream what you're doing. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's do some jam uh, uh, yeah. sessions. Watch making jam. <laughs> I'm putting the escapement lever in. I'm pressing the jewel in. And at least at the moment when I start to sneeze, right? Like really loud. That's the moment when you say, you know, Mark, just shut the fuck up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Mark, we... three hours you've been putting that one stupid jewel in. You, you got too much OCD, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then you have to mute everyone, you know, like concentrate. <laughs> for sure, for uh, sure. Listen, I just want to finish say, with you, Mark. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I, I just wanted to say to let to let, let everyone know how I feel. Um, so honored to have Mark with us. I know we're joking around. You can see we're we're a bunch of fun behind the scenes. Well, some of us. Um, sorry. And Mark is one of my heroes. He doesn't. He doesn't even know that. But I guess now he knows it now. But he's yeah, one right. of our heroes, it, and he's many of our heroes of the new generation of independent watchmakers who really can step out and make parts we couldn't make 15 years ago in our home, which means in house. Truthfully, in house in our home, um, because Mark has paved the way for many of us um, to have uh, what I call. Um, um, prototype CNC machines within reach. Whereas when Mark and I started going to school and watchmaking, that was, we didn't even, was, we couldn't even think about it. in a million years doing, doing, you know, making our own main plate within our four walls because those machines were unaffordable and the people that would run them, we couldn't afford to hire. I mean, it's, it's extremely expensive beyond what us mortals would even want to, you know, take a loan out for or whatever way back then. Um, in, in the inception of this. And Mark broke down these barriers for all of us. And I don't think he even knows the impact of those few little pictures that he posted online way back when of his ancient software and how he did it and how that really has transcended to many others. I think it's really transcended all the way to the whole Japanese start of all of Japanese independent watchmaking or uh, uh, to Hajime Osaka. I think personally, you know, he's impacted the world. And uh, he's an unsung hero that needs to be sung, not hung. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> All right, that's enough. You know, let me clean the shit off my nose here a little bit. <laughs> Mark, uh, first, it, it, I'm going to backtrack just one second. I want to ask you a question because uh, um, there are many of us who, who walk the path that I did who have an incredible father who also sits at the watchmaking bench. And can you tell us a little bit of maybe how your father has impacted you? And I, I think you're still sitting side by side, which is that that's just beautiful. Well, you know, it's 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 funny because the whole story, um, you know, like everyone has his own path, his own story. Right. And uh, at the end of the day, everyone is looking back to his career and saying, you know, like every single path you did is something, you know, you either choose it to go this way or to go this way. 
But once you hit one direction, you just did it and you can never go back and change anything. So you assume that you did the right choice, right? Um, and what you were saying, uh, my, my father actually, he didn't really um, accompany me like during my entire life. It's funny, um, when I was, since I, my, my, well, my dad, he's a watchmaker, right? Um, uh, from the beginning, his world is more into the repair stuff. He is really an amateur of Patek Philippe pocket watches and uh, he has quite a small uh, collection with Patek Philippe gondola watches. And I think pocket watches, and this is his life. My life was always more about creating things. Um, I'm a Gemini, right? And we love to create things. And when I started uh, to discover watchmaking, um, I once I wanted to become, um, oops, I think I, once I, be, uh, I wanted to become a um, um, architect, uh, architect, right? And to, you can, you can, you can uh, draw your drawings, plans, but you can never build something. This is something which is reserved to someone else. Mm -hmm. And then you have to give like this piece of work to someone else. And I realized um, that literally in watchmaking, you can do everything by yourself from the idea to the concept to the prototyping, to the manufacturing part, to making the piece, to delivering the piece, to marketing it, and also, you know, uh, and I think yeah. that whole having, thing- Having a nice dinner and drinks with the person that you deliver it to, and seeing the love that you give to them when you hand that over to them, the smile on their face, and that love. And, and you know what? Th that's what the people they get and they catch, right? This is- um, Let's say like the, 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 the dots on the eye, yeah. which you will never get if you just buy another Patek Philippe or another Rolex, which are, you know, like nice watches, but the missing soul. Um, and just coming back quickly to the dad family uh, and history. Well, actually, the very first person, of course, which inspired me, of course, was my dad, because when I was sitting next to him, when he was um, doing uh, 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 repairing watches, this is how you grow up. But then when I was uh, into learning watchmaking, it was clear for me that I will not do the apprenticeship with my dad. Um, because in those days, you know, you have to imagine you have the younger son, which starts to learn the same uh, 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 tradition as you do. It mm -hmm. felt like a certain kind of competition, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I went to Paul Gerber and I was lucky because I was learning a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. That name Great just keeps coming up everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My um, and Paul and me, we were still friends because we, we know this is something when you went, when you go through like four intense years, uh, like every day you, you, you are assigned to like a master watchmaker as Paul is, and you learn really like watchmaking from the beginning. Um, uh, I mean, Again, as I told you before, like the, the, the watchmaking family is something you, you will have like for the rest of your life. And that's what is really nice about it. Um, and, and that's why I wanted to say like the, the, the family, the, 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 my father. Um, so when I was doing my apprenticeship for four years, uh, I left, of course, um, uh, at some point, you know, Paul, because I needed to see the world. Uh, I, I went to Tiffany Company. I spent like half a year in New York. Um, for me, like 20 years old, going to New York, it was a perfect uh, deal. Mm -hmm. um, when I came back, I was still working for Tiffany & Company for 10 more years. And that's wow. when I touched the world of like the indus in, in the, uh, industrial manufacturing. Um, and when I was uh, 30 years old, I thought, uh, hey, now it's time to go back to your roots because this is really what I want to do and I knew what I wanted to continue is to put my hands on the machines, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what, that's what, what, can you tell us what watchmaking schools that you did attend? Well, I did. There was only one watchmaking school for the Swiss Germans in Switzerland. Uh, in those days, it was in Solothurn. It's called um, the watchmaking school in Solothurn. Um, and now it's actually in Grenchen, Grange. Mm. Yeah, I've been there, uh, of course. Yeah. Okay, um, and you know that in Switzerland we have like uh, four uh, uh, watchmaking schools in French, uh, the French part uh, of Switzerland, mm -hmm. um, and they, of course, because the French part is much historically and, and also economically 
they're much closer to watchmaking than a Swiss German part. Mm. And well, I, I, actually, I don't know if you know, but I, I, well, I went to Wostep in Neuchâtel. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this is one of the best school you can uh, go for, like from from uh, from an outside. Uh, uh, back when I had to go, first I did a four year school here in America at the at the Boulevard School, um, <laughs> but uh, and then five, six, seven years of apprenticeship and all that. Uh, back then, you had to do that to be even reviewed for Wostep. It, it was. It was different, a little bit different back then. To let out the Swiss secrets to an American is against the law back then. <laughs> you know, you know what? There was, no internet, there was no internet. There was no anything like that. So to let those secrets out, you know, you had to be way above, you know, spitting out chronographs and all that. And they viewed the American watchmakers, all of them as just, you know, hacks to fix a battery watch or something. So I kind of broke that mold a little bit. And, you know, my heavy metal pedigree, I had some, some real, you know, some cool metal dudes in the school who you know helped me get in there and uh, some Black Sabbath fans and all that kind of stuff sitting next to me, which you know we found out is is running rampant all through Watchmaker Land, all the metalheads. So <laughs> it was an enlightening experience for me as well to go over there and and you know go to Grenchen and all that. Um, and there's some, some some better schools now, and that was before the Woe Step uh, curriculum was implemented around the world. It wasn't really a good curriculum, or there was schools, but they we it wasn't one curriculum like that Antoine Simonet created and said, this is a pretty good base of where we all should be, you know, to make a really, a watchmaker that, that can do complications and so on and so forth. So it was very, very, it was incredible experience for me. So that's why I like to ask others what their background is. And I have a similar background like you. My grandfather was a watchmaker slash jeweler in the Catskill Mountains of New York. And, you know, eight, nine years old, I'm sitting at a bench with a Patek Philippe, uh, you know, opened up in front of me. So, I caught the bug really early, so it's wonderful to hear stories and um, and the, where the path started. And I think you're right. We each have to find our own way in watchmaking, and that's also something we should tell the young watchmakers that when they do go to school, it is kind of a regular school usually, and trains a broad way because how do how do we know that maybe you'll go maybe into what Mark's doing, which is manufacturing and behind the scenes and, and really passionate about you know. How, how we go about making these parts or will you end up being an incredible after sales person in your own shop or do you want to work for a big company strictly you know for a very good paycheck and work your way up to be able to touch watches you might not be able to touch in your country if you didn't have that training and you're happy there there's many avenues of watchmaking that's wonderful so uh, the school's the first courses are broad and then you can hone your skill and i think throughout life we find different paths as watchmakers as well we, you know, I did after sales service for many years because I didn't think I could make my own parts. And when I wanted to make my own timepiece, it, it wasn't feasible until I saw your machines. Yeah, well, you know, I have to tell you, Dan, there is something which, um, you know, when I was younger, I'm still not too old, right? But um, when I look back, and um, I always say that was almost like, like where uh, I was... Um, um, uh, excusing myself that I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I did not have time to do this. I'm sorry I did not time to learn this. I mean, watchmaking is literally like like this big, right? You cannot even see my hands. This, this is such a huge universe. I mean, where can you go and you have 700 years of mechanical history, right? Mm -hmm. So I would never say that someone who is doing only after sales service, he's like a, a lower grade watchmaker or someone who's taken care like uh, only about uh, quality control or is only doing uh, one part uh, in the industrial uh, um, machinery of uh, the, the, the assembly, for instance. I mean, you have specialized people. And I think the most important thing, what I really like, and this is exactly why I, I join you guys on this platform, is when you talk about passion, it doesn't really matter what you do. It's how you do it and how you feel about it, right? And I think that's, that's, that's about it. Because if you stand up in the morning and you go to your watch shop, to your, 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 to your watch brand, to your um, daily business, and you love what you do, I think that's it, you know? I would I say, like... I agree totally. And I think that's the message that, that this show is, is trying to get out, uh, to give even past that insight into some of the humans that me and you know that we've maybe worked with too and where their path could lead. And that what you just said is very prevalent. 
how the, the history of watchmaking is so broad, <clears throat> you know, we can't nearly know anywhere near anything we're in our lifetime. I mean, I mean, George Daniels wrote how many tricks we have to know as watchmakers, right, Mark, in his book. <sighs> and everybody think that's the number that we got to know. But Mark and I know because we broke into making parts in our, you know, in house that the, the you know, the, the technological part um, after George, now that exists around the world for independence, like in Japan and like what I'm doing here, what Mark does for other people and himself uh, from his place involves going back to school again to learn CAD, CAM, programming, how the machines work, how, what can we do, uh, you know, even building a machine from, from your mind like I did and like Mark did. Um, that, those are additive things of, of a modern watchmaker now, if that's the avenue you want to go into production. Perhaps I can add something then to your uh, to your uh, uh, to your comment here is uh, I think one of the biggest difference between an independent watchmaker and I would say an, 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 a normal watchmaker which is who is working under a boss under someone who tells you what to do is exactly mm -hmm. that you have to tell yourself what yeah. you have to do and and that's for me one of the biggest uh, uh, and and uh, what the biggest challenges out there is you have something to do. And no one is telling you how to do, but you have to find a way how to do, right? And that's where you can ask people around, you know, like, like other independent watchways, you know, do you have perhaps already had this problem? Do you have a solution for it? Uh, how do you handle it? And that's exactly how you grow and how you perfectionize, you know, what, what uh, your skills. Um, yeah, you know, I had a teacher once uh, in the Bulova school uh, when I was near, I, I had already, you know, finished the, the course, but was still, I kind of finished way early. So I was doing some complicated stuff and it was a little, actually, you know, he hadn't seen that timepiece. And, and I came up to him with a question like we, me and you would do when we're stumped, we go down the street, we call someone up, whatever it might be. We might have an answer from an old timer back then. You know, we got in a car where we couldn't figure it out for two weeks, even though we put it away in the safe and took it back out. We still couldn't figure it out or two months. Um, and he said to me, I brought it up to him and he said, you know, Dan, if you're going to be one of the world's best or even New York's best, you know, after sales service, dude, fixing really crazy stuff, here's what you got. You, you, you don't have a boss, just like what you said. Your boss mm -hmm. is the watch. Go back to your bench and yeah. it's you, your bench and the watch. You exactly. got to beat it. You got to beat it. And it's, it's true. It's, and that's the cool part of watchmaking. It's the same as learning how to play guitar, learning how to play golf. There's no end to the learning curve. It's, you could have a great day, a great week, you know, hole in one. You could write a song in an hour. Some other days it could take you six months to write that song. You could fight with everybody in the band. You could fight with the watch. It's very, because <laughs> people always say to me, how could you go to like, you know, the blasting martial amps to like silence, you know? And yeah. I'm, I, there's so many similarities in art because those, these people, um, they possibly are not collectors, Collectors know what we do, Mark. They know the intricacies and the hours we spend, the passion that we have, and that that's what we do all day. We're fighting with our, our metal to make it beautiful, but not just intrinsically beautiful, but mechanics, you know, drive drive everything in us, you know, to make something that's just incredible. And we're fighting it the whole way until it's in that little encapsulated capsule of double glass and steel or that crazy material you're using in that watch that you're working on now. And then they look at it and they just go like, how the f did you like do that? And that's when me that's and you were right. like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, <laughs> we kicked it fast. Absolutely. But, 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 like, like, uh, like your music, like, uh, like being a professional sports person, like do, do nothing. There's no shortcuts to uh, arriving where you guys have got to. Uh, this is starting off. At the, at the very base level, working your way up and up and up slowly over time, learning how many different crafts, how many different uh, traditional skills, skills that you guys have had to learn to integrate into what becomes your first your, your watch, your, the first piece that you put your own name on. And but, um, but it is, you know, what Mark was saying is, is um, it holds true through, through music and through watchmaking is the, the love we have behind the scenes is what we want to kind of show to everybody is that when we do get stuck, uh, there is people that we can go to behind the scenes, just like in music, if we can't break through a, a certain 
lead. I'm a lead guitar player. You know, certain we can't break through a certain pathway. Back then, there was no YouTube. You know, you tried to listen to albums and talk to people and figure it out. Um, you know, Mark was trained under the master. You know, it's Paul Gerber. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, the, the, that gentleman is sharing his knowledge to someone else, and now Mark is passing that down to whoever sits next to him. That's mm -hmm. the way it's done. Yeah. And it's a beautiful it's, thing. It's good that Paul Gerber's name uh, it has been a recurring thing over the last couple of weeks. Do you know, because uh, for people who don't know, Paul Gerber uh, was one of the guys who is making hand manufactured watches uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And uh, do you know, do, there was no internet then. There was no, uh, do you know, when, when Paul was a young guy, the same way as uh, young Marker is anyway, and um, <laughs> and of course yourself, Dan. Um, yeah. But there was no internet. There was no uh, avenue, no platform to uh, to put your work out there. So for largely uh, the next Paul uh, Paul Gerber, his work would have been known only by a very very select few people who were really the cognoscenti, those who absolutely knew uh, the, uh, th that niche. Uh, knew where to go to get a, a beautiful handmade watch on it. Uh, like we mentioned, Philippe Dufour last week as well. So you know, mm. these were the actual the architects of yeah. contemporary independent watchmaking. So it's lovely to hear their names coming up again in conversation because they didn't get the exposure they deserved right when they were at right. the peak of their powers. And so now it's nice that we. Uh, we give it's them kind a of, hat. It's kind of funny. I don't know, Mark, if you saw the, our first episode last week, but that is one of my things is, you know, um, Paul's work and the first pictures I saw of his uh, triple rotor way back when I was, you know, young in school, it just blew me away that he could be doing that as an independent. And like, how? How is that even possible? There was no internet. There was no anything back then. So in our first episode, uh, we saw the impact that he made with with the mechanicals, you know, that, that he spent time there as well. Now our second episode, I didn't say anything, but his name came up with you. <laughs> so I, w I would want the rest of the world that's outside of Switzerland, I want him to be represented, you know, because he is the Van Halen of watchmaking. You know, he's one of the, <laughs> he's, he's the pioneer of, of independence of, you know, I don't have to play my fucking guitar this way, motherfucker. You know, this is what I do. I'm making a fucking triple rotor, motherfucker. <laughs> that's, that's like, Paul, like, it's, two rotors not good enough. I want three. Maybe I'll make five, you know? And it's it's just insanity, um, not just what he did, but he, he then he went on to um, breed, you know, other unhuman people in watchmaking such as you. And he inflicted you with, with beyond normal drive. And, and gave you his expertise and you're carrying it on in your own unique way and you flew at it, man, you, you know, you took it to the next level. And you know what, I think that's exactly what um, I can uh, follow up with what you were just saying, you know, it's uh, whatever you, 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 you learn, um, you have to pick out the stuff and to uh, glue it on your own personality, right? Um, and I think this is also something, something a little bit for the people, the, the youngsters out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't try to uh, uh, imitate someone. Right. Try to um, catch what is good. Try to catch what is less, less good, but do it your own way, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something you learn over time. Um, you know, like if I look back like 10 years ago, I thought, you know, I had to do when I came out with my prologue watch, right, Johnny? <laughs> my very first watch. Um, mm -hmm. I want to talk about this, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I thought, you know, it's like, um, uh, I, have, I have, of course, the function itself is something different, but I always thought I have to do it the way like he's doing, or I have to do it the way I, like he's doing, because this, is, mm -hmm. this seems to be working. This seems to be working, but you have to do it the way how you should mm -hmm. or, or want to do it, because this is where you make, uh, to, to join like your own expression, and this is like a painter, right? This is like, this really are. belongs to you. Yeah, that's, that's what um, independent watchmaking of this era should be. Uh, it should only be that because we don't have to produce uh, 50 pieces per year to make a living. Um, you can be your own artist. That's what, when I started to write my own music, there was nothing called brash metal. There wasn't even a name for any other genre. All you had was heavy metal. That's it. There was yeah. nothing else. So when we created our music, 
it was a combination of what we grew up on, a little bit of, you know, punk and metal, you know, for Iron Maiden kind of stuff. But for me, you know, I was also a lead guitar player. So I listened to everything. I had jazz from my dad growing up, you know, blasting through my house. He collected blasting stereos louder than any of my Marshall amplifiers. And he's <laughs> blasting Frank Sinatra and Dizzy Gillespie and just, you know, telling me about the jazz days. So that's in my brain. But when I wrote music, it didn't sound like anybody else. But back then you had to have a record deal to go in the studio because it cost millions. And they all listened to us our music, they listened to Metallica's music when we went to go get a record deal, and they just said it sounded like shit. It sounded like you flushed your toilet. What is this crap? Go write a hit song. Be like everybody else. No. Independent mm. watchmaking is your of nowadays is strictly art. So you know, come out of school if that's what you'd like to do, go straight into making your own timepiece. It is possible. I would highly recommend you do after sale service and learn how, you know other people, how, how things can last and other mechanisms and so on and so forth, and then go into it. But uh, that's another, you know, that's, that's something to discuss later on. But okay. it, be your own self, like Mark said. Um, also, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a recommendation uh, for young watchmakers, because again, it's a similarity to other art or music. When you first become, are playing guitar, you want to play seven million miles an hour and do every lead and mix it all together and make a song that's so complicated to show everyone how complicated and all the stuff that you can do. But you need space. You need that song needs space to breathe. It needs a, an up. It needs a down. It needs moods. It needs everything. And so does a timepiece. So my suggestion is a lot of times we see a lot of young watchmakers, they want to make a timepiece and show off what they can do. And sometimes it just becomes a little bit too much, if you know what I'm trying to say. And you'll <laughs> see later on in their life, that watchmaker, has, as maybe he used it and that was good, but he found out that that wasn't the correct path. I'm calming this down. I'm calming that down. I'm putting what was on the front. I don't need to show it off. It's, it's now on the back. And, you know, it starts to represent after he calms down and becomes, you know, that, that watchmaker that's on that, that even plane. So I'd say, you know, in the beginning, I, I see that a lot now with, with independence. You know, they want to put everything on the front. Here's all, here's all everything. And, and it's just a little bit much for me, I, you know. Less is more. Sorry, sorry, Mark. No, I just wanted to say less is more. Yeah. Yeah, I, I said too much. I should be saying less is more. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, tell us, tell me personally, tell me about how you came about building that, your little CNC machine that has helped so many other uh, watchmakers and, uh, and how you learned how to run it. And, and you're still using it today from what I understand, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, this little CNC machine is actually not really entirely built by myself because I have to tell you that this goes all the way back when I was at um, apprenticeship uh, at Paul Gerber again because uh, my mentor, Paul Gerber, it was his very first CNC machine he got in those days. And I can tell you, we, we are talking about 1900, 1995, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look in those days, as you were saying, no internet, let we had electricity that was at least uh, something which helped us. But you know, in terms of like CO, um, uh, the, 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 the language, you know, to, you know, like everything which was connected, there was nothing. And I still remember when we got this machine, we didn't even know how to handle it. So we started to do the very simple like lines, you know, and you ended up, it, it gives you a gear. Um, and we did this in 2D. Because at th in those days, 3D was not even existing or just in the early sh um, um, stage. Um, so this machine, the, this machine was built a core, uh, from, from a company only in two, uh, 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 piece, in t two pieces, right? Um, and it has literally uh, three, um, how do you say? Um, axis. Axis, exactly. It's actually only a two axis and a half because you can do simu simultaneously like X and Y at the same time, but the Z is only doing like once at a time. So it's only a two and a half if you want. But at the same time, that's the, it's, it's about the precision and it's up to one hundredth of a millimeter. So this is exactly what we need. And the stability, the, it needs to be stable. And of course, it's a small one, right? So this was perfect. And 
when I was, uh, again, in 98, I start, first, of course, it was Paul who started to use it because it was his baby in those days. And I started in my fourth year of apprenticeship to work on it, to do the first components. And then again, uh, I went 10 years to Tiffany Company. And once I came back, I told Paul, one of the first machines I want to ask you if you, you know, would let go. Because he, in the meantime, he already got two he got others. That. He got that. <laughs> I saw a picture of that, the bigger one that he has. The, the exactly. Yeah. which works like 10 times faster, two times easier and, uh, you know, but also uh, like uh, five times more expensive. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I told him, listen, if you don't need this one, I would love to get it because I know how to use it. And now, man, listen to that. The, this still works with an Olivetti computer. You remember the brand Olivetti? Olivetti. Yeah, Olivetti, yeah. Voila. Yeah. I mean, only people who were born like in the 70s, they know about <laughs> Olivetti. Yeah. And, and up before, because this brand went out of business, I think, uh, late the 80s. And I mean, I'm still, I still need to transfer my digital files to the floppy disk. You floppy disk. <laughs> so, Nobody I mean. Nobody's even going to know what that is in this generation. No, no, no. And you know what? Uh, don't ask me which Windows uh, I, I'm running on. It's Windows 3.11. 3, 3. But that's because the program that you're using to run the prototype CNC machine, will, that's what, what it'll run on, correct? Exactly. It's amazing. And you know what? Now that I think about it, <clears throat> there is a picture of Paul's basement um, somewhere. And I saw a similar machine and I wondered, wait a minute, I thought Mark built that machine. How does Paul have one? I just figured it was the same dude that you guys knew that had built. And there it is. That's crazy, Two. man. There, there is one with my atelier, and the other one is at Paul's atelier. So what I'm trying to, sh what I'm trying to show is we're going to continue on this because this is very interesting, and I want to show people that we're not three dudes in an old barn in the shed on top of the Brasso Mountain, you know, carving metal out of trees. Uh, <laughs> even way back when, our, our mentor, Paul Gerber, was dabbling in CNC, and, and we want, I want to explain to people because – People don't have a very good notion when we say we use CNC as independent watchmakers of, of what we're doing with it. They think, oh, then why is this watch so expensive? He's just pushing a button and these pieces fall out of it like the kids go get bubble gum at the supermarket out of the machine and just put the quarter in and turn the thing. And they have to know that, you know, hey, I, I, for instance, you know, that we have to make parts, you know, they, they come like this. If we're making like here's my uh, titanium escape wheels and they don't always come out so good. You know, we have many trials and error over months and years to, to cut things. And then we have to cut them out of here and we have to program it, which is months and months of programming. And that's before the dream in our head to make the part, to get it into 2D for Mark or 3D for the rest of the modern world. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And Paul was dabbling in this way back when. And what we want to explicitly, I want to explicitly show people that these are not automated process machines that, that us independents are using. I really want to get the term out that they're called prototype machines yeah. because we are prototyping. We're making very limited parts. And the reason we're doing that is the reason that Mark said is for precision to part number two, number three, number four, number five, that they're all the same, which helps us to assemble the timepiece and time it correctly. We can still make these timepieces at a slower rate, one or two a year, and they will be precise but it's going to be still the, the differentiation by hand from one to another to another. It, it's going to be too great for us to make a living, really. So we're, I'm trying to get the word out that CNC is not a bad word because we're using it in a totally different way than big production houses and big watch manufacturers are using it. Yeah. And, I th and I find it fascinating because, Mark, I say again, you impacted me to build my own machine. I built mine from scratch for the prescription. Well, you know. There is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, as I told you, I didn't even uh, build my, 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 uh, my, my own machine that gives you a, a lead on that uh, bad end, right? You did something yeah. accomplished, which I was in, not even doing. Uh, of course, I had to um, uh, add the other, you know, like the fourth axe, which I put uh, behind it. I, I, I pimped it up a little bit, right? But... Um, uh, when I look out to all these independent watchmakers, again, it's how can I help myself to get things done I need to get done, right? And this creativity is not just ending with the part. It's actually starting with thinking, 
how, what, what do I need to do in order to achieve that goal? So most of the time, the people, they only see the component at the end in a watch, right? They don't see the unique process. They don't see the unique machines or the unique tooling you need to do in order to achieve that component. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly the, um, the, the added time and let's say not really added value because no one is seeing that unless he comes into your shop and you can show him all the efforts which go into uh, in this component, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the other, other what we can, you and I, Mark, and other people like us behind the scenes, we can influence and help other people outside of Switzerland, like in my country where it's impossible to do what I do. It's literally, I mean, we can't even get, you know, the right metal here. It doesn't exist. Oh. It, it's just a complete nightmare. There's no, there's no jewels. There's, there's no anything. It's yeah. zero. So uh, it's, it's not so easy. So we, through this show, can help other watchmakers see some of those machines, see behind the scenes a little bit more than just an Instagram picture where, you know, like in the old days in music, we would stare at the album covers as musicians and go, what, what kind of strings is on Joe Perry's guitar? I can see it, I can almost see it. You know, it's the same kind of thing that a young watchmaker is doing, or I did when I was looking at your machine, like how are you clamping it down? Are you using, yeah. are you using what are you using to, to lubricate the parts? How are you doing side two? I see these pins, it's just a picture. Um, and we can, I really would like to elaborate to young watchmakers the tools we use. I know you and I use a similar sandblasting machine. So yeah. th they're going to think some, okay, I would like to sandblast some parts. Do I just go get one of those automotive sandblasting machines? <laughs> no, you need a nice Renfort, you know, I mean, uh, those are the ones that, that we use and we can share that knowledge to other people, maybe save them some time um, of, of buying the wrong thing and wasting money. Young watchmakers don't have yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and this is exactly one of the problems we we face in our uh, business. And I mean, if you know, if you look at watchmaking and about all the machines you need to get, I mean, we're not even talking about the base machines or machinery or like the bench with the, like the tweezers, the uh -huh. screwdrivers, and I mean, just the base you have to have, right? But then if you add on the top the like the, the real machines, like you know, if you where do you have my uh, you know like the the Schäuble in in the back with. Uh, like a, a real showing equipped with everything you need, right? Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't buy that or afford that like in the very first uh, hour. Uh, this is really something you buy first, like what you need, like the meat, and then you you fill it up, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. every time you, you you add something on the top, you add something on the, on the top. Um, and that's why I think if you can achieve something with simple methods, this is where the, where I think you, you're meant to survive in this industry. If you can achieve it with less, you can always do it with more. But if you think you can already only exist with more, um, I think it will be, be, you know, it's almost like you're too, um, how should I say, too spoiled, right? Yeah. If you can get like like the the the, the, five, the six x the CNC machine delivering you like all the pieces already done, you simply assemble it and. Uh, and then you have a problem, you have to ask someone, uh, how would you do it? I think that's exactly what, what well, well, you know, the, like, like the long lasting, um, um, uh, um, you know, what, what makes you uh, uh, make a living out of what you do mm -hmm. is you have to uh, uh, help yourself. You have to yeah, help I, yourself. I, I firmly believe, I think you'll agree that, uh, you know, a good, an incredible traditional watchmaking school, a long two, three year school is imperative uh, to do you know, what we do. There's gonna be the exception to the rule here or there, um, but that's exactly what gives and instills in us what you just explained, you know? How, how do we use a Shablin 70? It's great, we, nowadays we can find some used ones and pre-owned ones and rebuild them. Mark, when you and I were young as watchmakers, they were out of reach, right? There was no, <laughs> right? Well, he laughs because we know that who had fifty thousand dollars, and that's before we bought the collets, which people don't people don't realize that just one lathe, one shablin, they look at the lathe, ooh, that must cost a lot of money. No, it's yeah. everything in the drawers over here. The only attachments that we had to buy, you know, oh, oh we need to do gear cutting. Oh, that's all. Yeah. So you know, nowadays. Um, there is the opportunity to obtain some of these older machines that you and I couldn't back then when we mm -hmm. did have in our mind, like, okay, I do want to make my own timepiece. It was way out of reach for us, way, way. But because of CNC, 
in mass production in watchmaking, these older machines were removed from service a lot of times, and they they have dwindled their way down into you know ordinary watch uh, shops, which is incredible. That's that's how so many people are able to service watches that we couldn't service even back then. Yeah, because so many people have the opportunity to cut gears at home that you know like no, like it's nothing now. And I know when you and I, Mark, went to school, we, we didn't see that. You you had to go to Gerber. <laughs> exactly. And you know, I mean, this is this is the difference. If I look at the Schäublin, which is actually in my dad's. Uh, 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 office or say atelier, it's not the same Schäublin. I mean, it looks the same, but the equipment is way different, right? He has like not even one fourth of the equipment that I have here. Or let's say this way, I grew up with the 70 Leith, you know, with uh, Paul Gerber, like every day is literally uh, turning something. And my dad, he is perhaps doing some bushing or to, to adjust a, a, a balance wheel or something like that. It's just, it's, it's a different need, right? And for him, it's perfectly fine. He doesn't need something more um, uh, evolved or something more precise or something more uh, equipped. Uh, it really depends what you need to accomplish with. And, uh, but the base, at the same time, always the same thing. Every single material you have, um, it's, uh, you need to take care as if it's your own child, right? I mean, I, how do you say Whenever I clean up my sh short blade, or even we're all tool freaks, man. Like guitar players can't buy enough guitars. It's the same stuff. Yeah, I mean, you almost like polish it. You like, you're like, oh, a... oh yeah. <laughs> and then I, this, I, I have a Sixus One Hundred One sitting behind me here. This is not normal. I got, I installed. Um, it just cuts gears. I can, I can program this to, to. Uh, let's see here. I don't, let me see if you can see here. But like I hop this up, it has digital readouts here, you know, to the micron. And if I want to cut gears, I don't know if you can see that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So I can. It has servos on it with a controller here. I don't know if you can see this controller. Great, great. That looks great. Uh, can, can you see that controller there? Yep. Yeah. Well, I can punch in any any amount of gears I would like if I want to make a, a chronograph center wheel with 110 teeth or I want to make a seven tooth pinion. I can just punch that in and then hit it. And, and of course, the six is I'm on this axis, but I can take this out and shift it this way and, and cut my gears. Or if I'm doing a dial and I want to do dial indices, I could you know, plug in 60 indices and divisions. And it's automatic. So yeah, we, we hop our stuff up to suit ourselves and, and everyone's going to hop it up a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mark, let's talk about the Vault Watch a little bit uh, and people that you help behind the scenes in the industry, if that's okay with you. It doesn't have to be about Vault. It could be about other, other people. You don't have to name names. I know a lot of times we don't have to. But yeah. I want to talk about what, what, what I really stand for in this show is uh, giving the love back to others who are in need. And I know you prototype for a lot of people that I, you know, some people that I know uh, behind the scenes, and you really are helping these people. I don't know if you even realize how much you help these people when uh, independent watchmakers, one of our biggest problems is we don't need 50 of one part. We don't need 150 joules. We don't need a thousand joules. It's mainly more than less than 10 or less than five at a time, sometimes one or two. And you fill a void uh, behind the scenes here for, for a, a lot of people. And you're a brilliant, brilliant, incredible watchmaker that gives your talent to others. And I'd like you to uh, tell us a little bit of anything you'd like to talk about. I know the Vault Watch is out there. Um, for me, it's, it's really interesting. The, the, the case material you're using, the movement <laughs> itself, the sandblasting. And not only that, but it's um, more than a few people working together as a camaraderie, and that's independent watchmaking. And exactly. And explore yeah. some of that with us, uh, I would greatly appreciate that. It's actually, it's, 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 as you say, it's, a, it's an incredible, incredible history. If I look at, um, you know, like my very first uh, encounter with Mark Schwartz, uh, he was uh, coming through someone who I met in England who told him, you know, perhaps you should reach out to Mark Yinny, he's not so far from you, and perhaps he might help you, right? Um, and I think my weakness, one of my weaknesses is I can hardly say no. 
Um, <laughs> I, I know it's it's sometimes I should do, and I I I did it in the in the past because also I have to uh, preserve my own health sometimes, yeah. right? Um, but you know when I encounter people. And when I met Mark Schwartz, I immediately saw his passion about his project, right? And um, when you feel yourself at the same stage, same level, uh, you cannot simply say, you know, no, uh, I have other stuff to do. I have other uh, uh, important things to do. Um, you know, you, I, the problem is I immediately uh, identify already with the project and I project myself, you know, uh, what could, how could that look like? Uh, how you know, where are the challenges? <laughs> and that's I, it's another of my problems. Um, I love challenges, but sometimes they give me nightmares. Um, perhaps later on, I can tell you almost like one, one of the nightmares I had with uh, the, the time burner, for instance. Uh, like, that thing's badass, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if many people know about that timepiece. And, and uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they do if they're a collector. But that's, that's just, that timepiece just kicks ass. And it should get way, way more press coverage and in the independent world than it ever did because you broke so many barriers with that badass watch you're, you're wearing right there. Well, hold it up, Mark, so we get it. <laughs> motorheads should know. The motorheads should know. All you collectors that are motorheads and collect cars and Ferraris and Lamborghinis or Hummers, whatever it may be. Look at that. Look you at need that. one of those. A that pest of action. Keeper. <laughs> Show them, show them what that does, Mark. Look at that. It's a, it's a piston that's go, that's, that's off the, what, the hour wheel? Yeah. yeah. It's off the hour wheel, and the piston reads the minutes. Exactly. The piston reads the minutes. You have from 0 to 30 on the top and 30 to 60 below. And you have the ring, which is the, the hours, right? You can read the hours. Yep. And for instance, right now, if I see it clearly over the video, that right now it's 12 o'clock. Yeah. And then we have twelve thirty, right? We have twelve fifty, uh, twelve forty-five, twelve fifty, twelve fifty-five, and one o'clock. And it's a crankshaft. So yeah, yeah. So and motorheads, listen, motorheads. Here's, <laughs> here's what I gotta say to all of you. You're listening. That is what independent watchmaking is. You're looking at it, okay? Absolutely. Sometimes we sell 10 pieces of something. Sometimes it takes off and becomes iconic. Sometimes it takes 30, 40 years for somebody to bring it to the public's attention for it to become iconic. That watch is iconic. That's <laughs> the idea behind that is, is just, uh, it comes from a watchmaker. It's, it's, it's just brilliant. It's brilliant, yeah. Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Again, you know, I, I didn't want that actually to, to cut the, the, the story down, you know, from, from Volt because uh, I think oh, no, they, deserve, yeah. they, deserve, they deserve just a little bit no, of an explanation. We have, from to, this. we have to talk about Andreas Streller. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, you know, uh, this is one of the reasons why I actually accepted this, uh, this challenge because I knew that Andreas, he did the movement components and I know, how, you know, the movement itself, it's such a complicated construction. Um, really, I mean, if you look at the, you know, like, like, like a, a turbio movement, right? It's, I would say it's not as hard as complicated to, to assemble all the little components. They have to stick together and move together. And I mean, again, what is easy, if you can do benchmarking, and that actually leads everything together with the uh, time burner, with Volt, with my watches, the Prologue, with uh, all these complications out there is when, when, you, do, when you don't have a, uh, the possibility to do benchmarking, then you have to do and uh, you have to become, you have to learn by yourself, learning by doing, right? Because um, uh, for, for the Volt movement, again, you know, the entire movement is, is turning when you set the time. So it's literally in the center of the X it's held together, right? Mm -hmm. So the construction of the movement is completely different. And if you look now to someone like, ask another watchmaker, can you explain me how I should assemble it? Mm -mm. Uh, you find perhaps one or two persons out in the world who already did it, but you, this is where you have to go through your own experience. You have to make your own experience and like to be very math uh, mathematic. Do you say, um, yeah, you have, Exactly. Like every single step you do, you have to be very careful and to uh, uh, make your notes, what you do, um, 
because perhaps the next time it's a little bit slightly different and you have to correct something. And I think um, that, 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 that's that something. People don't understand that um, uh, still to this day in watchmaking, something like Mark is doing, or something like I'm doing here, there really is no roadmap. It's a little bit here or there, it resembles this or that, something that someone did in the past, but there's no roadmap. And that's what we love as independents. It's, you know, the sleepless nights of, <laughs> how, how are we supposed to do this? How is it? What do you mean it, the, the movement is shock mounted in the case and then it has to turn around this disc and turn around that disc? And you, we see we see springs and pinions in our mind when we're laying down and we close our mind, uh, our eyes at night. And then all of a sudden we wake up and open a book or the Internet up nowadays trying to figure out an answer to something that there is no answers to. And that's the territory that Mark lives in. And that's what the vault movement is, which is it's pretty badass, bro. It, it is. And you know what? I mean, it's a very complicated watch. It's actually a, a challenge like on every single component. As you were saying before, you look at, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's nine o'clock here. So the bells will be ringing like nine times. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah so, um, yeah. And you were talking about the case. I mean, Mark is pushing the boundaries so far, you know, with the materials and you know, it's crazy when I see when they come back with uh, this new material associations um, and, you know, like everywhere you have to do, you have, how should I say, you know, if you are in medicine, you would like try to find the next uh, med medicine for, for, for the coronavirus, right? It's like yeah. you always have to, f um, this, this material has not been done yet. So how is it going to react? How is it going to, is it going to be water, water resistant, right? How is it going to fit the movement inside? Um, are the, the, that dilute, the dilutation, dilutation, you know, how is this material going to behave? Um, and all this is, has not been explored yet. So you have to do it. You have to give faith to what you do and also, also to listen to specialists, but then learning by doing, right? You assemble it, you test it, you see how things um, uh, in, interact. Um, and and the, the Vault team uh, in, in, in such is it's a highly, comp uh, highly um, how should I say, um, skilled team. So that's why when I knew that uh, Andreas is doing the components, he works with the best uh, uh, case manufacturers. So I thought to myself, you know, um, you, you, I'm just another part to the team which I hope will help the team to succeed because it's always the same thing. Independent watchmaking usually is always a teamwork, right? Mm -hmm. Even though you're sitting alone in your shop, I'm sitting right now alone in my shop and most of the time we're working alone, but in, in normally we are still founding a small uh, family and we uh, have to uh, rely on ideas from others, on help from others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Andreas, I know Andreas has a, a, a badass CNC monstrous setup there that's beyond and the way, way better than we all together. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. where his heart is beating, yeah. right? And yeah, um, I got to get him on here for sure. I mean, uh, you know, sure. Yeah, he's that's he, another unsung hero for the rest of the world. We're starting to hear his name as well. Um, and some pictures are starting to leak out a little bit here or there. And these are the cool, badass people that I'm trying to introduce to, to watchmaking world and keep coming back to everybody because, you know, two years from now, Mark's going to be working with, with somebody else as well. And he's always working with many people and helping people and other people are helping Mark. And that's the family behind the scenes that I'm trying to show that, that, that watchmaking really is an independent watchmaking, that collectors should support people like you, uh, the watch, the vault, because... If you're pre-buying a watch four years in advance, you know, sometimes you're funding that small independent watchmaker. If it's not a giant, you know, a conglomerate bank type of watch, let's say you're actually funding him and believing in his art. It's just like if you gave money to a, a, an artist years in advance for that giant painting you would like on your wall. Uh, you're keeping him in food and cars in whatever it is to, to clear his mind, to create that art in, you know, from his heart and give that love to you. And that's what we all do. And that, that's what Mark does. Mark doesn't have to help everybody, but he does. Like he said it to you all. He said, I can't say no. That's a disease. Mm -hmm. It's a bad disease that a lot of us have. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. 
Right? We think we're just that lonely guy in the shed on top of the La Brasso Mountain next to Audemars Piguet, and that's what we do. We carve a tree out, and it becomes a watch. But that's really not the case. We're all a little family behind the scenes. When we get stuck, thank God for technology now. We can call others, uh, you know, or, or for Mark's sake, he lives right there. He can go around the corner like I, you know, like I go to 7-Eleven. Yeah. We don't have that here. But if I can bring this information from where Mark is to someone in Japan or someone in America and inspire them to do and step out of the bounds like I'm doing here, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Roger W. Smith is doing where he is trapped on his little island. He's a master. But what does he do? He's, he's not just hiring other watchmakers from school to sit there to make himself money. He's, he's giving them, here, get up, learn this, get up and go, get on your feet. You can do this. You can go do this. Here's the knowledge that they didn't teach you in school, or this is the real world knowledge. Just like if you went to law school and came out of law school or a doctor coming out of, you have to do your apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. you know, he's giving that opportunity. That's what I would, you know, I'm dying to do here in America once, once I'm in production of brilliant. Yeah. That, that's production here, is, is breed some more Americans and show them, you know, you can get some of these machines here. I'll show you how. You can't, yeah. there's a way to get this steel. I got a friend in Switzerland or in France by the border. You can get, you know, you can get what you need. It, there is a way to do it. It took me this long to do it, but let me show you the shortcut. And that's mm -hmm. what we all really should represent as independent watchmakers. And, uh, you know, Mark helps way more people than he's telling you about. Okay. I know mm -hmm. there's people in like Finland maybe and other people areas where he's he's prototyping for other people they he might do a few parts for them to get it right and then they need more of those parts so they get to you know have them made more um if they need 20 or 30 of those parts they decide they're going to keep with that style they might go elsewhere later but they're using mark's genius brain at onset and that's mark's mark has that gift that's just mind-blowing He's, yeah, yeah. he's a creative mind that he, he needs to create all the time he can't be bored Another bad decision. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but when I first wrote about you, Mark, it was because I had seen something that was completely different to anything I had ever seen before. That was with your prologue. And for people who don't know what the prologue was, prologue was a, a crownless watch. A crown is the button on the side of the watch that pulls out, you adjust the time, you wind it up, you correct the date. And Mark's watch didn't have one. But right around the case, the round waist of the case was a rubber ring and a button at about the four o'clock position mark. Yeah. Yeah. And if you push the button once it would set, you could use that ring to adjust the time. You press it again, you could correct the date. And if you set it back to W, it would wind the watch. So all three of the functions of the crown were carried out by this rubber ring, which rotated around the waist of the prologue. And I had never seen anything again about before. And I can remember writing about it. And this brings uh, actually a story uh, for me, because previous to this, I had been writing uh, reviews about lot bigger brands, globally recognized names that we all know. We, we, we pick up a magazine uh, under the two-page spread on the inside cover, two-page spread on the back or the middle or something. So I was writing about these watches that we all that everybody knew about. And I would write my review and I would send it off to that brand's PR department and say, look, I've just written about your watch for the watch press. And I would send that off to them and a day or two later, I'll get an email back, you know, saying the, these words, thank you for your interest in our brand. And that was, wow. So that was what I was getting back after spending a fucking day writing about this watch <laughs> brand, yeah? And um, so and in one case, I actually asked one of the big brands, I said, look, I'd love to find out more because at that time, 2007, 2008, their website was shite. And you couldn't get any information off it. So I asked this big band, could you please provide me with some uh, material that I could read up and at least be able to compose a, a, a kind of a historic where you are and who you are and how you got where you are. And they said, yeah, absolutely. We will sell you a book for £148. And I go, right. So anyway... One so, day. Wait, wait, wait. so Johnny, I want to explain something to people because we didn't, we haven't touched, I haven't touched upon why I'm with you. 
Okay, so just okay. briefly on Mark, Mark, you'll find this really interesting. It's really freaking cool because it's part of what this this truthful show is. Okay, the behind, not just behind the scenes. Look at my equipment or whatever. This show is like is going to be, and it is already like nothing else. Johnny just told all of you a corporate story. Okay, it's the opposite of everything independent watchmaking stands for. It's the opposite of what thrash metal ever stood for. We don't conform. We do things our way. In music, it was, this is how I went on stage, my jeans and a t-shirt. I didn't wear makeup and I didn't puff my hair up or whatever it may be. You got what you got and what you were getting, the people knew it was me. If Real. you caught my guitar pick, that means I printed the guitar pick. You know, I came up with the t-shirt design. Someone came up with it in my band. Somebody printed it. The album cover, we hire someone famous to do it. The whole premise, the whole idea was us. It was, you were getting a piece of our heart. It wasn't manufactured from a dude in a suit in a tie around a table with other dudes in suits with a tie around a table coming up with some marketing idea. And Johnny is a brilliant writer and he's written about many, many timepieces for many, many uh, magazines throughout his career. It's a long career. And Johnny's here to show you what and how lost that corporate thing is. It's a beast. And especially as you know, Mark, I, I don't expect you to comment, but the Swiss watch industry, so many, I mean, they weren't even on Instagram for like, to what, yesterday? And it, it, know, yeah. how it runs, like, do you push this button over here? What is it? Is, am I really going to reach somebody? Like, it's so, you know, and that's wonderful because that's how the record companies were too. There's no difference. Yeah. And in, if, you're, if, you're, if you're supporting independent watchmaking, you're also supporting Johnny. Johnny's an independent watchmaking writer, and he's going to tell you the truth. Hey, mm -hmm. you know, someone has this kind of piece, not just to talk bullshit because they're paying me to write this. You know, this kind of sure. piece is cool, but I can't wait for his next one because this one maybe doesn't fit my bill, but man, he's a badass. Look at those mechanics. Like, I know it's going to, you know, appeal to five or 10 of you out there, and that really, that's all that matters each year because that's how many the guy can produce. There's not many of us on this planet. Yeah. But he's going to tell you the truth in his writing as we're gonna tell you the truth in our art, you know, that you get my art. It's no, you can't tell me how to do it. Yeah, you can request, you want a pink dial instead of a blue dial. Maybe I'll do it for you if you're nice, I don't know. You know, some people will, some people won't. Mm -hmm. That's independent watchmaking. It really is our art and let us artists do our art, represent ourselves, not just in our watch, come to our workshops, see our workshops, see the tools we had to restore with our fingers, with our blood, our sweat, yeah. Our money when we didn't have money, you know, buy find three machines. One's in one's in France. You had to hide, get a friend to get a car, and he had a broken car. He had to grab his girlfriend that day to drive to pick up that Shablin seventy because he had it's the missing <laughs> index plate that you needed to make your gear, and he found it, and you paid him. I mean, it's all in that dude's watch. Yeah, it yeah. really is. The story is all there. <laughs> it's just like in music, starting a band in the beginning. We're in a van. Excuse me, we're in a van. We're cramped in there. We got, you know, two stinky roadies with us. They haven't showered in three days. But the love is to get to the next gig, and we're going to play. We're going to take over the world. We're going to show people our art. And that's really what I'm trying to show to the world, that there's a, there's a, a lot behind the scenes here. We're, we're, we're working our asses off, but at the same time, we need to show the rest of the world we're human, what our art represents. We're each individual's marks badass timepiece on his wrist there you know that's him you know i mean in that era just like the music era, right yeah, right. Johnny, like every, every album has an era of a band like if you look at you two and go way back that's one era how they felt yeah, mm -hmm. okay? yeah. It, and it's the same in watchmaking it's not just a progression of our art uh, of our skills it's a progression of our humanness of yeah. what, I, what, I, what, I absolutely what us. i absolutely believe that the the independent watchmakers his work is an extension of that personality behind it. I've always really identified with that. I've looked at Vianney out there. I've looked at uh, what Mark has done. I've looked at uh, Drew Stepan, what uh, Andreas Streller, who we've just mentioned, mm -hmm. is the, a, a different type of, of uh, intricacy and uh, pr presentation. And everybody yeah, has I was showing what, what Mark is, is, I think, is also trying to get across here. Maybe I can, uh, the, the people who are into music also, I, I always try to use those analogies because I, 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 you know, I don't play music anymore, but I lived that world for half my life. Um, 
and there's a lot of those people that might be listening here that are just maybe becoming collectors, Mark, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I want, want to give them the, the insight that the equivalent of what Mark does because of where he lives and where he works is the equivalent of very famous musicians jamming together. If, you know, Van Halen picks up his guitar and goes down to jam with Steve Vai or, you know, whatever it may be, getting in a room, that, that rare opportunity where musicians from different bands are jamming together. When Mark is creating for Vault right now, he's jamming with Andre Estrella. He's jamming with some other person that's helping, helping him maybe with design, one of the greatest designers it may be that's helping what's in his brain, what's in the, 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 the people from Vault and the whole team. And it's like a big watchmaking jam. And what comes out is not a corporate kind of thing because it's a small little jam. It's yeah. just in a room with three, four dudes and you're figuring <laughs> out the best way to do it. Sometimes there is no jam. Like me, I'm all alone. I've been here for three years, you know, in seclusion and, and going a little bit crazy, going a little bit VNA, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why we're chatting right now. <laughs> huh? Yeah. I need a release. Right now. I need a release. <laughs> These titanium escapement parts. No, it's like you said. No one's ever done it before. I got yeah. no one. To ask, no one really to ask. So it's just, that's what I'm going through here. You know, with some programming and, and getting mm -hmm. getting the parts on my bench. It's an escapement yeah. that only you know that that uh, my friend Luke Monet, who we'll, we'll have on the show as well from Arts Mechanics. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but you know he, he's another one of the walking geniuses of the modern era who works with everybody from Google 4C and making parts for all different people. I shouldn't really say that, but he might or might not make parts for them. I'm, I'm going to forget uh, the handling panel again. He, 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 the escapement. he brought the escapement into the, the wristwatch size, uh, the Lewis Richard escapement, um, and it's badass. But mm -hmm. I'm, bringing it, I'm doing my own rendition of that, in, out of all the parts in titanium. Um, so, yeah, like you said, you, you got to kind of challenge yourself, right, Mark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, uh, along with the nightmares, right? <laughs> oh man, you have no idea. <laughs> hey, Mark, let's talk about music. What do you do? You listen to music when you're when you're working uh, without your father sitting next to you. What music do you listen to? What's in your past? Oh boy, you know what? Um, I'm. Um, let's say you know, like the the wild youth uh, is over. Um, so I mean, when I look back, you know. To be honest, you know, when you were talking about Antrax, I have heard about it, but I'm sorry, I have never really listened to it. Perhaps, I don't know, because in Switzerland, uh, it, it's way, way far away. I don't know if... Uh, so I heard about it, but um, I'm not familiar with the music. For me, when I was younger, like 20 years old, you know, um, I mean, I was listening for someone like, like uh, uh, Trent Reznor, Right, uh, nine inch nails, for instance. Well, yeah, um, yeah uh, you know, like Rage Against the Machine was cried yeah. in in those days. Uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, right? Um, Metallica, yes. Um, and um, I don't know if you like it or hate it, but you know, Rammstein, you know, like yeah, the real yeah, German, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely killer. So, uh, but nowadays, I mean, I was always, I always loved you too. Um, for me, this is like the YouTube, um, I would say it, it's like, uh, uh, my prologue watch, you know, it's like steady, classical, nice. And then you have like the nine inch nails, the Rammstein with the, uh, uh, with the time burner, which is more edgy, which is more, <laughs> but again, what I like, and to be honest, I mean, I have my, uh, not a big uh, sound machine here, but. Every time I work by myself, of course, I listen to music. And to be honest, very honest, um, uh, I, I love, do you know Hans Zimmer? Of yeah, course, you know Hans Zimmer. Absolutely. And I, I love his music, right? And every time when I uh, do something, yeah, sometimes, you know, perhaps I uh, work with Gladiator, sometimes I work with uh, uh, um, uh, Lion King, you know, or with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio with Inception. I mean, it just accompanies you and it's true in your head you know when you're sitting on your bench this is your own small little world and this tells you the story and you know the music uh, accompanies you and so i think to be, it, it is really important for me music is really important um um 
And my world is more today, less Rammstein, even though I still love them. But it's more about, you know, you too. I have my face of Faithless. I like Mike Oldfield. Um, wow. You know, I don't need it. You, you're telling us all that while you're working on these masterpieces, right now it's mainly the, the vault stuff, I would assume, that you're, you are 80, 90% of the time you're actually listening to, to music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But today, I no longer. Everyone, I think everyone out there finds what, what I'm trying to show the world that, that's very fascinating to people. They think we're sitting in a completely silent room like no. we're in school, you know, and, and it's, this is the part of my show that I, that I find very fascinating. I know you're an old man and there's no more, you know, Ramstein blasting while you're ripping apart a vault. <laughs> <laughs> no, because this becomes dangerous. That's the problem, you know? If you try to assemble the small little component, then you listen to Ramstein and you want to break out. <laughs> Let's, this is what I do when I take a coffee, right? Take the coffee and then you do a... <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, another, another, another misconception, you know? Uh, espresso while listening to Ramstein and working on Vault. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Of, so, of, something's got to give. <laughs> something's got to give. Well, listen, if you were into Metallica um, back then when you were younger uh, and we were rolling through, it was, it, it was the two of us on tour together coming through Switzerland. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah you just missed us. Oh boy, did I know. Uh, I would have thrown you uh, my, my uh, uh, underpants, you know, like uh, <laughs> usually do it. <laughs> That's awesome, man. So no, but, you know, uh, as you say, you know, like, like watchmaking is such a small family and it's so funny because, you know, when you, when you grow up in this small family, you, you get older and you know, like most, more or less like, 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 you know, the youngers who come, who remain, you know, the older ones. And I think in music must be a little bit the same thing. You know, you know each other, you know, you know who. Yeah, because think of what um, it's not. What I did is not just music. You know, um, there was only four bands with a unique sound that started a whole new wave, <clears throat> and not just the the first wave was, of course, what we, we created was called. They had to invent a name for it because it was faster, and they invented the name thrash metal. Uh, but later on, my band crossed the barriers and uh, collided uh, thrash metal with hip hop uh, when we did with Public Enemy and our on our own song, and that was. You know, the record company is telling us, you can't put this out, you know, career suicide, you'll never play again, and no way. And, and luckily, we were in the independent band, let's call it. We had a contract where we could do what we want, which was unheard of in those days as after we got licensed. Because they didn't know what to do with our music in the, in the beginning, and we ran our own show, and we created this mass, mass underground following all by ourselves, meaning Megadeth, Slayer, uh, Anthrax, and Metallica, so they really didn't know how to market it. So, um, excuse me for a second. They didn't know how to market it. So basically, we were an independent band, same as an independent watchmaker is. And mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it, the similar. That's why I keep using the, the similarities between the two: is breaking the rules, doing mm -hmm. what we want to do, being you know, giving our art to uh, the collector. In this point, if you're a watchmaker or you know, the, 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 the fan in the old days who really loved you for you. And mm -hmm. they are getting a piece of, of all of us. Um, and it, it, you have to support what we do is what I'm trying to show. And we, as elder watchmakers, um, have to show the younger watchmakers some of our, not just little secrets at the bench that we were shown, like me and Mark, when we were coming up through the ranks. It, it's, we had this opportunity of technology to talk like this and of course, you can see our humanness. We're not just these stuffy little dudes that just sit at a bench. You know, Mark's blasting Ramstein. We're we're cool. You can talk, you can contact us, and we'll help you the best we can, and just give back some of that love to the world. So, if you're supporting independent watchmakers around the world, you're supporting all kinds of things that are going on behind the scenes. You know, kinds of struggles uh, to get our art out there, and our art is is uh, going to be here for hundreds of years, if not thousands, because Mark and I have seen timepieces and we know how they're built. We've seen, and his father, he sees his father's, what he works on, uh, timepieces that hit our bench that are hundreds and hundreds of years old. So we know what lasts, we know what doesn't last. So when Mark goes to build a timepiece for himself 
or if he's working in conjunction to give his love to someone else, he's, he's using that, what we've learned at our bench to overbuild. Someone in a suit and tie in a corporate board meeting, that's not how that watch on your wrist is running. When we open yeah. up the back, you might look through the back and it all looks nice with your Geneva stripes on there, but those Geneva stripes are made by a you know, CNC machine usually, or a girl that's just sitting there doing them really fast. They're not, it's not the love, it's not, the, the wheel isn't three times thicker than it should be. The pinion isn't made out of a specific alloy that only Mark wants it to be made out of. They're, they could be you know, penny pinching here or there because they're making 500 to 1,000 watches a year in low production. We're, 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 that's not what independent watchmaking is about. It really is making the best of the best of the best. That's what at the beginning, I when I was introducing yourselves, guys, I was saying that the watches that you're making now are modern history being made. That these, that in another 200 years' time, if we're all still about, these are the watches that are going to be. We, we hope, we hope, we hope, yeah, you're right. We hope so. I look and, at it again. Let's look, let's look at music. When if you have an original copy of the first album by a certain band and you still never opened it, or even if you did open it, that marks that person's history and it is part of history and it's worth something. It does yeah. become something in an auction. It might, if it was signed, it becomes something that's really valuable. When you have a Beatles yeah. album signed by somebody in the Beatles, it becomes something. I really do feel we're living in that era right now. That if, if Mark makes a timepiece and he signs it and it's customized for the customer, he's leaving his art behind. That could be at Sotheby's a hundred years from now being sold because it's an imprint of that time in Mark's life. And that yeah. represents all the independent watchmakers around the globe that are creating their art. Everybody. I think you mentioned Sotheby's. Like, you know, like, there's a lot of watchmakers who are, who are of our time. Their watches are starting to turn up at these auctions yeah. and where they weren't recognized for what, what they were 15 years ago, yeah. uh, t certainly 20 years ago. Now they are, the hammer is falling on big numbers whenever yeah. uh, these watches are coming up for because, auction. Because the big companies laughed at people like Mark when he started out, like, good luck, bro. You'll be back at this bench somewhere. But yeah. now they, it's actually a little bit reversed where they're trying to learn how to use Instagram. <laughs> you know, and learn, yeah. and, and they're trying to, and they're barring all the things in a corporate way of, oh, we have our handmade watch here. They were going to make five of these this year. And they think like we can't see through their smoke and mirrors. Some people won't. They hope they won't. You know, they charge extra amount of money for their limited edition, but it's really just the same timepiece. It's not the, it's not coming from the human, mm -hmm. it's coming from the struggle. It's not coming yeah. from within. And, and that's what independent watchmaking of this era is, re is representing. And what is being birthed, this second wave. I don't yeah. think we've seen this since, since what, Mark? Like the, the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s, when people were making timepieces in their home. Mm -hmm. And you know, well, in-house is not just a word. It literally is, it, this is in my house. Mm -hmm. you know, that's in Mark's, what we could call it, your house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have brought it to you, Mark, that uh, Joe and to yourself, uh, Dan, that you cannot imitate authenticity. Do you right. know what I mean? That you, the, the independent watchmaker is doing something that, that comes from in there. It doesn't come from a spreadsheet of uh, we need to do this to uh, uh, to to feign the appearance of the independent watch sector because yeah, the independent watch sector is growing and growing and growing and you guys I, i'm so delighted to see that this is your time and uh and for mark like you know i, I know what you've been through over the that since, since i first got to know you it, there there have been ups and there have been downs um yeah. it's just it, it you know um dan i don't know if you realize that there uh, mark should do you know, his his prologue watch is it okay to talk about this one yeah, I mean, if you have t if you have time, guys, I'm uh, I'm here. Um, <laughs> listen, we'll, we'll, I, 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 we'll, we'll do it briefly. We're going almost uh, almost an hour and a half, so maybe we'll because uh, I'm sure it's getting late uh, in Zurich town as well. But um, no, talk, Dan's about, talk, talk about his prologue watch. You started, finish it up. So, well, uh, Mark's watch had his name on uh, Mark Genie, 
uh, with with an I, Jenny or Jenny? Jenny. We 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 say Jenny in Switzerland. Jenny. We say Jenny, Jenny, exactly. Jenny. But I know in French they say Jenny. In in in, in, in the states would say Jenny, right? Jenny. So uh, we 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 say it Jenny, Jenny. So uh, good to know. But there was another brand, another company called the Jenny Watch Company. It was spelled J E N N Y, Y as in yellow, and um, they own another pretty well loved brand and uh, they don't trade under the name jenny watch company so they don't actually manufacture watches uh under the jenny brand as far as i am aware mark but they took an action against uh mark and uh, the end result of this was that uh, mark had to more or less cease production uh of watches bearing his own name and uh, to me that was one of the great injustices because even if Jenny Watch Company were making watches, they were nowhere near. They weren't close to what you were making, Mark. And yeah. there was no threat. If there was no, if anything, being associated with Mark Genie was a massive boost to their own credibility. And I took, uh, I'm afraid I took great exception to uh, the, the pettiness of that brand uh, or that family, that company taking that action and the end result being that you had to cease production of your own watches, and uh, I was pissed off at that, and I still am. So I, uh, I actually, I I, I, you I mentioned that I did hear something behind the scenes uh, about that. I'm very sorry for that, Mark. Uh, but it, you know what? This is a good point to bring up within within our within our show anyway, so that other independents do know that there is a corporate world out there. <clears throat> There's not many patents in watchmaking that'll stand up in court. They could threaten you with a letter, but I think Mark knows from where he lives. Once you step foot in the courtroom, it's almost exactly. unheard of that any anyone ever wins anything against a patent. Patents are merely for the corporate people to say, we got nine patents on this and eight patents on that. But as far as mechanics go, we've, we've pretty much invented it all. It's just a twist on something that's been in the past every single time. So it's just a threat and we want the independents to know don't be bullied, but to have what's been done to Mark, that that's pretty, you know, that's pretty fucked up. It's your name, bro. Yeah, well, you know, it made no sense. Sorry, Mark, for cutting across. You let me have the last speak on that one. Yeah, well, you know, this is exactly what I was, uh, I was finding your own name, which you want to put on your watch, right? And I think then that's something uh, you're certainly well, well familiar with it. What, what brand, what name you want to use for your watch? It's so complicated. So I thought, you know, I, I couldn't find something like cool or nice or uh, interesting. So I thought, you know, let's just take your own name because at the same time, it's you who you are doing the watch so just sign your piece which i did i knew that there is a company or let's say not, not the company i knew that the, the brand yinyi was filed but they were filed since 1984 i think and they never did any production since that day but from the moment i came out with my own watch the prologue Three years later, I received a letter from the lawyer saying, hey, you should stop immediately with uh, using uh, your brand name because uh, you are in conflict with our brand name. And I was saying, hell, you know, uh, your brand name already writes itself differently. Uh, and I'm actually adding Mark Yeni, so I think everyone can see that's not the same thing. But the laws here in Switzerland, and that's, as you say before, then the corporate world has its own rules. And I, I, I was just confronted with the very um, basic functioning of this corporate world is if you do not have enough, enough money, you cannot defend anything. And uh, I had my like most expensive ride with my with the train from Zurich to Bern to go with our lawyer from Zurich to Bern and back. And that cost me like 5,000 5, Swiss francs, just back and forth and talking about two hours uh, in the room to get a no-go, right? So, uh, and it's, it's in the same line as you were saying with the patents. You can only defend your patent to a point which uh, the, the size of your wallet. Right, right, right. Absolutely. But it gives you another very clear example of the challenges that not only do you have to face mechanical, innovative, inventive challenges, 
Mm -hmm. But it's also the bureaucracy and the red tape of uh, heck your family name. It, it it annoyed me. I can remember being intensely annoyed for you. But uh, do you know something? You've uh, again in true independent watchmaking style. You've uh, you risen above. And uh, do you know? <laughs> you, do you know? Yeah. I mean, just just to, just to summarize it a little bit. It's because I couldn't wear or bear my brand name anymore. I had to be uh creative right and that's why i was using uh how sh how can i con uh, continue with what i love to do so i can create watches for other people yeah. without using my name yeah. until i will find one day something which really fits me you know like the next brand name i want to use yeah. needs to really fit what i have in mind um, and yeah. until that day i can do my work for other people and that's how yep. you know every single challenge leads to an Something opportunity yeah. yeah well look at that little cnc machine that paul gerber paul gerber dived into he had to learn how to use he passed that love on to you right you, mm -hmm. and eventually he got a better machine he gave that love to you the machine is still being used today to give love to i know a, a many many other people um who would have had to spend not only there a lot of money to go somewhere else, but like a lot of times you to find someone like you that will let me make you one or two of these. Let me make mm -hmm. you three of these. You're not going to find that. I think Mark knows there's many people who think they can start a watch brand because their father has is very wealthy and they come to Switzerland with endless amounts of money just because they, they want to start a watch brand. And there's plenty of people that'll do that, but that's a very time consuming thing that could take minimum of eight years to develop whatever their 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 basic kind of dream of mark breaks that down and breaks that time down to almost nothing and he that little machine is still going today with its precision it's blessed mm -hmm. me it 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 broke me out to go okay mm -hmm. that dude can do it you know what else has he got in his little room there wow. <laughs> what kind of spindle does he have on there and i know that travel to japan i think I mean, if we, hopefully we do get to talk to Hajime Osaka to find out what picture he saw. One, you know, one of the rare breeds we know. He didn't go to watchmaking school. He took a different approach. He built his own machine like me from scratch, and I know he had to see Mark's pictures, and that had to give him that incentive to go ahead and do that. And look where he is today. He's creating some incredible, incredibly wonderful timepieces. He dove really into that prototype CNC type machine uh, um, kind of thing, and I think that little machine. And everything that Paul Gerber did to bless other watchmakers through Mark is it's like a family tree. It's blessed me and I hope I can bless others here in the United States of America. Well said. I think, you know, guys, uh, sitting from where I'm sitting, uh, Dan, you're a star in your own right. You're gonna be a star in your 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 new specialized field. Mark, you are a star uh, of you know, the independent scene and yeah, you, you were the guy that, first uh, that I, I i first got to know you introduced me to so many people in the independent sector you introduced me to your friends the colleagues in the AHCA. and uh, hey you know for you're I, just I, saying I, that because he said his favorite you. Band was you too hmm you're just saying that because he said his favorite band was you too hey i can take you too i like <laughs> ram <Ramstein> as well <laughs> i like i'm trash man <laughs> 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 so, um, <laughs> but uh, Mark, it's been a real, real, real honor to have you uh, on in the metal tonight. And uh, I would hope that we could do this again sometime, man, um, because uh, you know you're you're a fountain of information. You're entertaining. You're great. You're, <laughs> here, you're a great crack to listen to. You know, so um, it's yeah. it's been an absolute. I, I, just, I want to say something too, Mark. I want to thank you for the. You also put up some uh, some videos of yourself working on your Shaolin on YouTube. I know I've come across those, and I've certainly looked at those many yeah. times. Thank you for sharing those to the public and taking the time out of your busy day uh, to do things like that. That that helps everybody. Every little thing you might think it's thirty seconds long that it didn't <laughs> impact somebody. It really does because there's you know what. I, I to be honest, I stopped a little bit being active on uh, social media, like for the last half year, one year. But what you're saying right now, it's a motivation for me to step back a little bit and to, you know, like, like let's start sharing a little bit more. Because, you know, when you are 
behind the computer, you're making all this work, right? Because it's, it's a setup. I mean, it's a time you have to put in something else during this time you're not working on your bench. But, you, you know, listening to you then right now with other people, they recognize that and it helps. And, you know, there is nothing more noble, at least for me, to hear, you know, what I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't even know what kind of impact that, uh, like, these little films, these little movies have on, on other people. So it's, yeah. it's for me. Uh, Mark, that's beautiful. It really is. It's, um, I'm glad that, that that's what this, this, what we're doing here, it impacts everybody, both you, yourself as the person that we're talking to, as well as hopefully the people that are listening, because yeah. I know it's impacted me. But, you know, not everyone... Um, can go around the corner to, to Andrea Streller. So we're trapped. Um, there's no one here. There's nothing. Zip. Zero. So imagine that's the United States of America. So imagine someone else who is in another country with even even less resources. Uh, if mm -hmm. We can birth, if we birth one watchmaker somewhere, I know there's a big rebirth of Chinese independent watchmakers now doing a few of them incredible work. They're, I mean, some of them are making their own lathes from nothing, from just metal. And, you, you know, the things that you are doing and have done, those little tidbits might be all they're seeing to get their ideas from. And, you, you know, you really are impacting people from where you are. And it, it's a blessing, man. You're a blessing to the world, bro. Thank you. Thank okay. you. That's um... – Guys, I think we have uh... – so we've kept Mark out from home late into the Zurich night. And um, but it's been absolutely fantastic uh, having this conversation with you, with you tonight. And again, as you, uh, Dan, I'm sure yourself, you, you were delighted that we were having him on. So uh, thank you very much, Mark. And, uh, and you're very welcome. welcome. And any time again, you call. <laughs> we will. We will be back. Yeah, and next time I'm over there, Mark, we'll be hanging. But good luck. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck. We're hanging out with Rammstein music and Antrax music. <laughs> <laughs> listen, I told you already, I, you, you, what I listen to here is big band jazz stuff. I can't listen to the music that I created. So we're on the same page. <laughs> it's a different time in life. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Perfect for me, perfect for me. And it was a pleasure for me then to, uh, to, you know, to talk with you. It was, as you were saying, Johnny, like one hour and, uh, what, uh, 20 minutes, 35 minutes, it went over like nothing. So it was a real pleasure for me. And I'm looking forward to, you know, the next encounter. We will do this without a doubt, Mark. Uh, we can We look forward to that day, indeed. Like you know, so, we, we uh, both thank you, Johnny, for being the host, uh, the hostess of the mostess, and uh, very much so. You know, keep writing right. what you're writing, and you know, keep keep spreading the word of independence to the world. You got it, And for your typewriter, if you have a typewriter, if you're old right. and have an old typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> Siri, <laughs> Alexa, write this article. <laughs> Come up All with right. some words, please. Good night, yeah. everybody. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Thanks, everybody, for watching the uh, second installment of In the Metal. And uh, we will look forward to being back with you again next week and uh, to have a, another look at someone else's world in the world of independent watchmaking. Thank you, everyone. Ciao. So...